Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this virtual event, Improving International Cooperation on Air Quality for Health, Climate and Development. And it's being held alongside Stockholm Plus 50, a couple of us are here, and it's hosted by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the Government in Ghana and United Nations Environment Programme. My name is Andrea Hinwood, I'm the Chief Scientist of United Nations Environment Programme, and I'm very happy to open this event. I'm actually not going to say much more. I'm going to introduce a fantastic speaker, Rosamond Adu Kisi Debra, who's a mother and a fierce advocate for action on air pollution. She's co founder and executive director of the Ella Ramley Foundation, and she's a champion of the, the UN Global Breathe Life campaign. She became a clean air advocate after her nine year old daughter Ella died in 2013 from a, year, a, a rare and severe form of asthma. And Rosamond, I know you will have heard this many times, but we can only imagine. But what is fantastic is that you've spent these years campaigning for a second coroner's inquest into Ella's death to determine whether it was linked to air pollution. And in a decision in December 2020, the coroner ruled that it was. And Ella is now the first person in the UK and possibly the world to have air pollution listed as a cause of death on her death certificate. And this is horrendous to talk about, but Rosamond, we're really glad you've joined us here today to talk about your continued fight to secure the right for children around the world. When you've finished, we'll hear from another panel of experts and we'll talk, but we know that many things to do. So please, Rosamond, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And um, I must start, um, and those in Ghana, if they recognize the surname, it's because that's where my heritage is from. I'm Mitty Trio. I'm just saying that for one of my fellow um, Ghanaians on there who's, smi who's smiling. Um, we are incredibly <laughs> proud <laughs> British Ghanaians, as we like to refer to our, our, ourselves. So as you know, introduce me, I am the new, um, the Breathe Life Ambassador, and it's um, a fantastic um, opportunity to speak to everyone around the world. The reason why I am actually in Stockholm is we had a meeting um, yesterday morning now, it seems so long ago, with the current president of COP26, Alok Sharma, and it was myself and other mothers and Dr. Nira, who is also a mother, and she's the director of public health from WHO. And our mission is that children need to be at the center of everything we do and it needs to have a health element as well and the reason why i believe this so fiercely is if you clean up the air children can breathe better and it also solves climate change we had an initial meeting uh, with mr sharma in cop 26 and this was our follow-up meeting we made enormous progress and to the point that we are hoping that COP27, is, it is a hope and a wish at this stage, that health is going to be at the centre and the right of children to breathe clean air as well will be at the centre of COP27. This hasn't been decided, so I'm not saying anything yet. Um, along my travels, and as you mentioned, my dear daughter Ella um, passed away. And when I think about hair suffering, I think about other children across the world who have respiratory illnesses, especially Delhi, concern me with the amount of air pollution. And in the UK, I continue to work with the government, but the coroner was very, very clear. He had three recommendations. The first one was about the government need to take PM 2.5 incredibly seriously. They are, you know, the worst, the pollutants. They are probably smaller than a grain of sand that get into the bloodstream. The second was public awareness. As much as we work in this field, amongst the general population as a whole, there is still a lot of work to do. And he felt we could achieve this by our monitoring. And the third ask which he had was people in health. Everyone in health, it doesn't matter what you do, whether respiratory, everyone in health needs to educate themselves, not only about asthma, but about air pollution as well. Because there was a lack of knowledge when my daughter became ill. It's not a blame game. We've now found out what happened to her. But through my journey, we also don't we know that there are, for instance, 500,000 children under the age of five every year who die prematurely. And the new report that has come out in 2019, 9 million people died prematurely due to dirty air. 
So my mission is very clear and my message is very, very simple, is that we all have to clean the air up. Obviously, I am impatient because I know that a child per minute is dying somewhere, somewhere in, in the world due to dirty air. So I know when we come to these conferences, there are a lot of words said, but what I'm after is obviously action. And from my country, I work very directly with Mayor Khan and he's brought things in like the ultra low emission zone. This isn't just a one person solution, by the way, it ranges and Ella's inquest taught me that it ranges from governments to mayors and cities, to local councils and to individuals. And when it comes to the air, we all have to get together. And I think it actually requires legislation. As I speak right now in the UK, I am trying to get through the Houses of Lords clean air as a human right, because I fundamentally believe my daughter's rights were breached, i.e. due to where we live, unfortunately, we, we live near a busy main road, and due to the filthy air she was breathing in, that's what started her asthma in the first place, and ultimately was responsible for her death on that fatal night in 2013. But as much as, yes, yeah, she is the first person in the world to have that on her death certificate, we all know here she isn't the only one, and there are thousands all, all over. And it's not just about children dying, it's about the quality of their lives. So I'm here with other parents, parents for future, warrior mums, and we are all here for our children, that any decisions that are made for a healthy planet, children must, must be at the centre of that. And that's why we are in Stockholm 50 plus. One, Rosamond. Thank you, Rosamond. Thank you very much for participating and for giving us on this important issue. I know that you have to um, leave to go to another forum. Is there My any apologies. last? No, but is there any last comments? I mean, you've you've said it all. We don't need to to uh, say it again. Is there anything else you'd just like to leave us with before you yes. go? I am, sometimes I struggle to find the right words to talk about clean air. It is so important and health really, I, I do think we need to bring health at the center of everything. COVID showed us people all across the world care about their health. And I believe this is a way of moving the conversation on, you know, the building back greener, if we have health at the center of it. And also that will mean we bring the most vulnerable, I talk about children because of my daughter, but we also know all the elderly are vulnerable. And we must remember air pollution. I talk about asthma because of what happened to my daughter, but we know there's now about 70,000 papers linking air pollution from cardiovascular. And my point to governments again is they pump trillions into healthcare, they do. And maybe some of that money needs to go into cleaning up the air and people's quality of lives, including young children. I struggle to try and imagine that there are children out there who are suffering like my daughter, who, who basically was poisoned her life. And that's what I struggle with. But we are here. I know there are lots of people who are, who have the, they have the know-how, they do. The scientists have been telling us for quite a while. And I do believe whenever we mention climate change, we must mention health. And that is a street. I think that's that's a bit of the puzzle that has been missing up until now. So please have have a good conference. And if someone's recording it, I shall watch it back. I shall watch it back. Those that I have missed. But thank you so so much again for having me and allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thanks, Rosamond. It's fantastic, and I'm reminded of a. Uh... Uh, one of our youth representatives from Uganda, who said, you can't eat coal, you can't drink oil, you the gas. And I thought to myself, the fossil fuel message, I thought that was a bit. I actually hope you weren't talking about Vanessa because I did listen to her speak they, yesterday and I met her. So I hope that um, she made and something we should. Here's Vanessa. So, absolutely, she and, and you know that simple. 
questions with all interest. So we we've got a great panel today. Um, uh, before I uh, hand over the Rachel Otto, who is the head of the Secretary of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, no solution is a global public health and climate issue. Air pollution, as of air pollution, toxic gas. But Andrea, we have trouble hearing you. You're fading in and out. Maybe if you just switch off your camera, please, and we try that we can hear you properly. Sorry. Challenges of a virtual environment. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I just wanted to reinforce the issue that air pollution is a global public health and ecological and agricultural issue, and it is also part of the climate issue with the emission and co-emission of pollutants and, of course, greenhouse gases. And, of course, as we warm the planet, we also increase air pollution, i.e. air pollution plus heat equals more air pollution. So it is something that if we clean up air pollution, we improve health, but we also improve health from a heat point of view and we help mitigate climate change. There are many co-benefits. So we've already heard eloquently from Rosamond about the public health implications. I think it is probably one of the best uh, studied environmental issues and we have the evidence firmly in place. And I think the the focus of this Stockholm plus 50 meeting is that we have solutions and that action needs to be taken very quickly um, by governments, by industry, by everybody in terms of reducing air pollution. Because air pollution doesn't recognise uh, borders or boundaries. The issue of transboundary air pollution is a significant one and all of us with um, a common goal must actually work together to actually resolve it. So that's why this discussion is so important. And it's why we also need to have stronger regional cooperation on transboundary air pollution. And just to put a plug in that we look toward this year's International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies, which is on the September the 7th, where we will be focusing on the air we share. And so, of course, this particular session couldn't come at a more important time. It's a, a session that I'm particularly uh, passionate about. So I'm very pleased to hand over to Martina, who's going to introduce an excellent panel for this afternoon. I'm sorry I can't stay. I wish you well, and I look forward to hearing about the outcomes. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, and also uh, to Rosamond uh, again for the inspiring remarks and framing this event so well, both from a science and from a very human perspective and bringing home why this topic is so important for all of us. And um, you said it, I'm Martina Otto, I'm heading the Secretariat of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, um, which is housed in the UN Environment Programme. And I'll be moderating the panel discussion that's following right now. And uh, while well, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is really taking this nexus between these issues at its heart. Um, I'm introducing the panel topic, uh, Together We Can, Strengthening Regional Air Quality Agreements for People and Planet. And uh, here we are deliberately emphasizing that we need cooperation to take on uh, this issue to take the action at the scale and the pace needed. Um, Andrea said it very eloquently, um, air pollution has no, knows no boundaries. Um, so this cooperation across regions, across geographical and, uh, and uh, political delimitations is really important. And uh, we're holding this session back to back with Stockholm Plus 50. And uh, therefore, we also want to unpack a little bit the topic that uh, Stockholm Plus 50 put up with responsibilities and opportunities. It is about taking responsibility and it's about grabbing and making the opportunities that we have to address the issues a reality. And now I'm introducing the panelists and we're really glad to have a fantastic, uh, fantastic set of speakers. 
we have Dr. Claudia Hieper. Uh, she's the interim head of the division environment, biodiversity, forests and ocean at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development in uh, Germany. We have Andrew Clark, uh, Chief uh, for Chemicals, Air Quality and Waste uh, in the Department of State of the United States of America. We have Am Am Emmanuel Apo. Uh, he's the Acting Director responsible for Environmental Equality, Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana. And he's also uh, the co-chair of the WHO Urban Health Initiative. We have Marcelo Mena. Uh, the head of the Global Methane Hub and uh, the former Minister of Environment of Chile. And we have Johan Hulensterner, uh, research leader at the Stockholm Environment Institute. And um, well, with that, um, maybe just briefly to introduce uh, what we'd like to zoom on in uh, to together. Uh, and that is actually three key questions. And if I could ask you to please keep your responses to about three minutes uh, so that we have a bit of time for discussion, including with some questions from the audience. Each of you will have uh, time for a one minute closing statement at the end of the panel as well. And maybe a message to the audience, if you please would use the chat function um, to pose your questions, uh, we will try and consolidate them, pick a few up if we can, and should we not be able to get to all of them, we will cluster them and get back offline, uh, likely along our highlighting uh, the event on our, our website and giving some responses there as well. Um, now to the questions, what are the challenges, political, societal, economic, in addressing air pollution as a critical sustainable development problem? What are the potential benefits of addressing air quality and climate change together in an integrated approach? And to circle back to our title, which role can regional and global cooperation um, cooperation play in, in this? And um, maybe with that, let me uh, first turn to uh, Dr. Claudia Hieper. Uh, BMZ is uh, supporting uh, the climate and clean air agendas in your activities. Why are these co-benefits important for BMZ and how does this actually translate into the activities? Yeah, thank you for these questions, Martina. So you, you also asked about the challenges. And uh, so I think two key challenges uh, are lack of awareness. That's something that Rosamond also pointed to very much. And the second, I think there is some misunderstanding on the economic costs and the benefits of actions on air pollution. So when we come to, to the lack of awareness, then yeah, I think, for example, the Clean Air Coalition does a great job. And also, it's it's really good that the United Nations General Assembly in 2019 uh, announced this International of Clean Air for Blue Skies, which actually we as Germany supporting since its inauguration of in 2020. And and if we see that, for example, in 2021, UNEP's communication channel on the day reached over two, 12 million people, then I think we can see there there is some outreach. But of course, it, that's not enough. And uh, the groups Rosamond was mentioning are as important, uh, and and I think this is still very much uh, key to make this visible because it's not so visible sometimes the impacts. You know, we have this huge number of deaths, but is it really attributed to to air pollution? That is not so visible, but it's actually very real. That is, I've also have uh, been concerned myself because I moved with my children to Kathmandu for three years with a nine month old and a three year old child. And I was really worried about the air pollution and they had to go with the mask every day. And I'm happy to be back in Germany uh, now, but of course there are all these people uh, who are still there and have to survive uh, in heavily polluted environments. But what does it mean for, for German cooperation? I mean, we really to, do see this integrated yeah, as um, Andrea said, there is this a strong link between climate change and air pollution because the short-lived climate pollutants uh, like uh, black meth uh, carbon, methane, ozone, HFCs are uh, having positive. And uh, well, if we address this, we at the same time, we can improve air quality and uh, reduce emissions. And uh, what do we do specifically? Well, we have not so big actually, some dedicated uh, projects um, against the fight of air pollution. 
but we also have a kind of a number of projects uh, which address uh, urban development, uh, mobility, etc., which, which also have waste management, which also have actually co benefits uh, for uh, air pollution. And but I think what is very important is actually that. It can also be good to communicate uh, developing countries or emerging economies that uh, these co benefits, they are then immediately on the ground. I mean, that's not something abstract fighting global climate change. It's it can show both local benefits for their population for health as well as uh, climate change effects. And I think that if we can monitor this and show the evidence uh, that that is, can be very uh, good to also increase uh, the political will in the countries uh, to act on this topic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. I think you touched upon uh, a lot of the important points and maybe really to hold this thought that the benefits are immediate um, and very local, um, giving an additional argument to act um, if the story itself is not yet compelling uh, enough. So, and, and actually highlighting as well the importance of a number of the sectors where we actually um, can then take, uh, take the action. Maybe we can get back to that uh, a little later as well. But let me now turn to Andrew, Andrew Clark. Um, not long ago, uh, we held the UN Environment Assembly, uh, where you've engaged uh, already a discussion on clean air, uh, regional responses to the air pollution crisis. So really mobilizing um, us globally on this. Why is this an important issue for, for the US? Th thank you very much for, for the question, uh, Martina. Yes, um, for, for us, I think that, that you know, Rosamund, when, when she spoke to the best, that the, the devastating um, health impacts are why we, we think this is an issue that really is not getting the attention it deserves um, globally. And, and one that we, you know, when, when you look at what is happening and how, how much, like, like, health and economies are suffering due to air pollution, we think it is something that that is an absolute top priority in terms of international environmental work. So we are working very hard to try to get this higher up on, on the agenda. So we very much appreciate events like this to, to talk about this. And but I think that you know the, the question about the challenges of addressing air pollution are important and and, and for us to tackle. Um, and we've seen um, a, a few challenges that um, about the mistaken beliefs about what is necessary to address air pollution. Um, so one frequently cited challenge is that you can't do anything without the money for a big, expensive network of reference grade air quality monitors, um, like the kind that we would have in the United States, for example, and that you have to have all this, this really perfect data around all your entire country to um, and have an air quality index and anything less than that, you're not able to act. But, um, you know, that is, of course, the gold standard and something that we're very, you know, we're very proud to have had developed in the United States, but we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Um, we certainly have seen with a lot of our work around the world that even small investments and out of the box, low cost sensors are able to give you very good indications of what you need to do to improve air quality. And, and with something that has health impacts so large, even, even small incremental improvements have very big effects on health. And, and it's always important to get a, get a start going in the right direction. Um, and the second challenge that we hear is you can't you can't do anything about air pollution because it's all coming from somewhere else. Um, and of course, transboundary air pollution is a huge problem, and that's why we we are working for more regional cooperation. And in the United States, um, under our domestic laws, we have what's called what are called good neighbor provisions under our Clean Air Act, where where states are required to to um, reduce emissions if they're they're affecting the air quality adversely in other states. And we've made a lot of progress addressing transboundary pollution with Canada, um, but it's still almost unheard of for, for local air pollution to all come from elsewhere. So there's almost always something that can be done locally to improve air quality. Um, and the third challenge, and, I, and we find this to be maybe the most, um, the most dangerous thinking about air pollution, is that um, is to view it as kind of a necessary part of economic development. That that you know this is just kind of your your trade off for when you when you're um, growing your economy, and that's just not true. Um, study after study has found that the positive economic benefits from from reducing pollution, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency um, estimates that the benefits of reductions in air pollution exceed costs by a factor of 30, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and it's worth noting that the United States grew while cleaning its air. Um, between 1970, when we enacted the, the Clean Air Act, to 2019, 
Uh, aggregate emissions of common air pollutants dropped 77%, while the U.S. gross domestic product grew by 285%. So we, we've certainly seen that, that not just in the United States, but all around the world, that, that economies grow while you reduce air pollution. Um, so we think, you know, we think this is an, a very key, um, important to get these messages out there. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, thinking about how we address air quality and climate change, which of course are very, very closely linked. We think it's, it's um, we, we also think though, that it's important to think about how one topic can maybe help Push along the other topic, um, rather than just necessarily having to address them together. So, and I'm coming at this very much from the air quality world, so that maybe maybe affects my perspective. But I do think that um, that when we look at addressing climate change, it's often very complicated and politically fraught, and there are a lot of differences between where you know where the most emissions are coming from, both now and historically, and where the effects are most felt. And sometimes it can be difficult to act on the problem when when local action seems to have little a little impact on the overall problem. But with air pollution, um, it can be relatively simple. Um, every country, if if anywhere where you reduce your own local air pollution, you're going to improve your local air quality. As we said, there there are, even where there's a large transboundary component, there's always a large local component too. So that means that that local action can have a very fast, and very profound effect, which I think is an important um, way. To get really motivate local and you know grassroots action, and of course when we do this, we when we reduce air pollution, we're also reducing greenhouse gas emissions in almost all cases. So that's I think that's a very important way that we can address these two um, issues together. And so I think uh, you know looking at this is a, a good way for us to um, maybe give us another another avenue to pu push forward our climate goals, which is something that we're very much trying to do. Um, and I think that, uh, as, as we've talked about at this site event and that other events uh, previously, you mentioned our, our event, you know, uh, collaboration is, is extremely important. Um, transboundary pollution, um, can only be addressed collaboratively and the scientific work on pollution flows, um, on pollution makes more sense if it's carried out at an airshed level rather than as a, a country by country level. Air does not move along national borders. Um, so there are economies of scale in air quality management. And that's why we've been working in many regions around the world to call to build what we're calling uh, communities of practice across regions to help um, nations pool their air quality resources and coordinate policies and promote joint learning and sustain activities that that um, that can continue after um, maybe specific project funding runs out. And that's why we're also trying to, to as we've you know talked about that at UNEA, we're looking for ways. To uh, make more robust regional frameworks, um, hopefully learning from the success the UN ECE region has had under the Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution. Um, so thank you very much, Martina. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Andrew. And you covered a lot of ground. Um, I think we see a common thread coming coming through here. Um, these immediate local benefits uh, and. Uh, well, really, really holding holding that thought uh, uh, that yes, there is a large transboundary uh, component as well um, in in many cases, uh, but that shouldn't hold us uh, uh, back from taking action because there are these local benefits. And I thought it was really important as well that you started to dispel some of the myths that are are around um, when you when you talked about well, it's a, is it a necessary trade off uh, to economic growth? And no, and you came with very clear numbers as well why that is. Is is not the case, and it's true. That's not only true for air pollution, but often we we talk about yeah, let's let's develop first and clean up later. Um, but uh, that shouldn't be the we're long past that in in a sense. And I think we have enough evidence that this is this is not the, the the case. And and then the measurement. And I thought that was really really interesting as well. Maybe we can come back to some of this as we as we go along. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we go to uh, Emmanuel Apo. Emmanuel, we, we do see uh, a light in the corner, which is very shiny. <laughs> Maybe if you can do something about that, because we want to see you. <laughs> I, I, I must be. I must apologize. It's raining. There's a torrential rain, very st uh, stormy, and my, our, we have a power outage now. So I'm using one of my phones as <laughs> to be able to. To, to do the connection. So pardon me with that. Uh, we have a very big storm now, and uh, it's become very difficult for me. And then the, the national grid is off. So I'm in darkness now. 
Yeah, okay. but um, well, sorry to hear that, and thank you for being yes. with us, nevertheless. And it's yes, good to yes. hear you so, properly. Um, we, you know, this situation of air pollution is globally, and uh, those of us who are in in, in the third world, uh, moving to lower income countries, our situation is mostly precarious. Um, the challenge is that. Emmanuel, you're fading. Rose, no. Okay. I don't know whether we lost you or whether you're trying without. It's not uh, limited. Okay. And then, you're um, and then, can you hear me? Hello, you're can back. you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm finding that now. we're uh, lagging. And um, a, a lot of people are dying. And you know, most often there's a competing, uh, I do call it, a request for funds from lo uh, 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 local government. And then. And um, there are competing requests on malaria uh, control, um, healthcare uh, facilities, infrastructure development. Manuel, if we don't hear you anymore, maybe if we try with the with the camera switched off, uh, we have higher chances. Apologies for that. Our virtual world. No. We tend to burn our uh, waste, and we have a lot of plume of black smoke into the atmosphere, which is a source of uh, black carbon. And people are inhaling and falling sick. We also have problems with NOx and methane emissions. You know, we have a free range animals, we don't put them in, in cages, park docking. We move around and decay almost everywhere in cities, even in cities. So we have problems with methane emissions and all those things. So these are the key areas that really have some global impact in terms of climate. And, and because of the climate change, we having problems like a lot of flooding. In our cities, we have a lot of uh, pest infestation. Um, malaria mosquitoes tend to breed more, and you tend to have more uh, malaria incidences in, 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 in African countries. So there's a need to look at this synergy, which has been identified, where, and the sources are, where these things are coming from, and then control from the source. They'll be able to know what the problem is. We set up monitoring networks, to be able to gather relevant data. We set up, how uh, to get a good data for modeling, we can predict the future scenario. And then we act on that. Manuel, we unfortunately lost you again. Mm. Yeah. Every time I'm saying something, you're coming back. So you're back. Fantastic. <laughs> so how do you come back with some good uh, policies to be able to do that? So you need very good policies. You need very good uh, legislation to, to serve as the base for, for driving the air pollution problem, uh, control problem. And we also need to do more research. Africa, when you can go to the global scene, you want data. You want information, you don't even get publications on Africa. So we need to do more. Epidemiological studies, research, and then be able to come up with some information that are most indigenous. You can find it in African setting and to be able to control. The other aspect is that we need to also look at, and we are doing a lot also in Ghana on this, on the adaptation uh, aspect, how we are adapting to climate change how we are using the local government acts to be able to control air pollution. And we're working with the Stockholm Environment Institute on that. We're doing emission inventory, come out to know the sources of emission, and then control them from the sources. These things are being done, and then the countrywide too, we also done that. 
and it's really helping us to implement the uh, NDCs that we, we uh, targets that we have. And these are things that we have seen some form of uh, as we call it uh, benefits that we are de uh, uh, deriving from. We've seen air pollution levels reducing, especially in Accra, but the rate of reduction is very, very low. And so we need to, we need to do more. We need to act, do what we call stakeholder engagement. And EPA is very, very good in doing that. We're able to draw all the relevant stakeholders together to be able to come up with uh, uh, common solutions and work towards that. We work with academia, we work with local government, we work with the health sector, we work with the researchers, and globally, we're doing that. So uh, there's a need to have that global touch. South-South cooperation, work together, pull resources together, collect reasonable data, share information. Information sharing is something that is really lacking in Africa. If Ghana generates data, Cote d'Ivoire, which is, have the same, let's say West African country that have almost similar climatic, uh, 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 how to call it, variable, may not have access to that. So there's a need to have data sharing, data to be open uh, uh, for, for everybody to look at. And look at the political strengths also. And then uh, the key thing that we are also doing now is the awareness creation aspect. If you don't create awareness in the local dialects, local languages, Ghana have more than 200 tribes, more than uh, 90 uh, languages. So if you want to use only English, it won't go down well with everybody. So you need to touch base with the people. You need to come out with some jingles, some uh, form of uh, awareness creation material to be able to do that. And we are doing that with a lot of NGOs in Ghana, and it's really yielding very, very uh, good fruit. So um, this uh, uh, meeting or the, 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 the uh, gathering is very, very important to us as Africans. And I think when we be able to go and dialogue like that, we should be able to share information, which will be beneficial to all of us. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And I think we have seen South-South cooperation just right now here uh, with your sharing your experience. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously, we're very proud uh, that, uh, well, Ghana, and more precisely as well, the, the work in Accra uh, was one of the first things that under the CCAC, uh, we, we helped with the Urban Health Initiative at the Breathe Life work um, to, to drive forward. So very, very happy to, to, to listen to, um, well, what, 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 where you've landed, uh, where you are at the moment, and the sharing of information. Let us um, move to, to move continents, and uh, we have uh, Marcelo, Marcelo Mena, and as a, as a minister, the climate and clean annexes was cr a critical issue for you, as we all know, and uh, as well as a scientist. And uh, now you um, are heading the global methane hub. What links are there between air pollution and methane and uh, the solutions that you're supporting through the hub, uh, which has been created uh, as a response to the global methane pledge by, by philanthropies? Marcelo. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um... I'm going to um, also link it a little bit to the air pollution agenda and the sense of the discussion. Um, so, the 1st thing is that uh, the 1st uh, well, thing that we have as a challenge today in terms of linking the climate or the methane agenda overall is on the climate side is that methane itself is not being prioritized in terms of funding. We're going to uh, we're, we're commission a report that's going to be published soon. It's going to highlight that only 2% of MDB financing is focused on methane mitigation. And when you look at that, only the, the, um, the things that are funded are actually not on oil and gas, but on, on agriculture and waste sector. And many times you could consider that you might be creating a problem if you do not manage the leaks of landfills and other things. So therefore, you know, we have to be looking. There's no, we have long-term um, goals by MDBs in terms of funding. But uh, but there's very little link on the short-term warming potential that we could prevent if we reduce methane, and so therefore I think it's important to that you know the same way that the CCAC highlights that there's two levers that we have to pull, one in the short term and the long term. The NDBs and the climate finance world is always only linking only thinking the long term, and that's um, that's something that may uh, over over 
outlook opportunities that we could have for developing countries in these things. Um, and also, um, I just wanted to also make uh, the problem that we don't have a, a visible problem on air pollution and methane agenda. We don't measure hardly anything. Uh, in the developing world, um, you have, for example, huge gaps. If you look at the maps of air pollution that, in which there really aren't no measurements. Uh, we at the university that I work in have been working with IQ Air and we've developed around 150 uh, surface monitors uh, in places that hadn't been reporting measurements, uh, including Montevideo, Uruguay, for example, that didn't have uh, uh, online measurements that could be compared, or Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, you would think they would have that information available, but it hadn't been. And so if there is no problem on air pollution, then there is no solution. And that's really an important thing there. Uh, also, um, regulations, even the EU, EU largely out of sync with WHO uh, regulations. So if I'm, if I'm Chile and I wanna update my regulations to the new WHO uh, recommendations, uh, the pushback will be like, hey, but you know, the EU has, has a, hasn't updated it, why should we? And so then therefore, you know, we have a lack of leadership that needs to be in sync. Because if we have around 190 or 160 jurisdictions committing to net zero, well, if we look at the air pollution, there's no jurisdictions that have committed to WHO guidelines. So a net zero world has to be with zero air pollution because it's the most important uh, health impact on um, emissions overall, and these occur today. This lack of link has led us to have false solutions. Diesel, for example, supported for decades, and it came at a cost of the air pollution. And that's why uh, European capitals have much higher air pollution concentrations than any countries in the US, because diesel is, uh, has been seen as lower in CO2 emissions, but it came at a cost of increased PM, NOx, and black carbon. Wood burning. You know, uh, you could go to Bonn and enjoy the COPs, uh, COP23 was the last one I was there, and, but you have uh, preventable uh, emissions due to wood burning. Copenhagen, 60% of air pollution is wood burning still. Paris, 30%. Uh, London also. There seemed to be good for climate, but it wasn't if you also incorporate the black carbon. And that false solution has caused the fact that in Chile we have a huge issue with air pollution. And that lack of link, is actually uh, allows you know the the finance the only the 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 link only look, looking at uh, CO2 and non CO2 being overlooked uh, has led us to have some different uh, challenges. I remember when I was in the government and uh, a bank, a European bank, came in and wanted to fund climate action for green loans. When we started looking, we said that home retrofits were would be great to reduce emissions. Uh, which made complete sense to reduce any kind of emissions. The, 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 the problem that we had was that the bank said, hey, it's not reducing CO2 because it's wood burning. And so therefore we can't fund this. And of course, that's absurd. So you have to have that link. Otherwise you miss out on opportunities and, uh, and, and don't take uh, advantage of the political economy advantages that this linked agenda brings. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Marcelo. Um, very clear statement um, about those false solutions and the unintended consequences if we don't look beyond the, well, the border of the plate in, in a sense. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we now move to Johan. Um, and I introduced you already. Last but not least, uh, as the research lead at uh, SEI and deeply involved in working with countries under also the CCAC policy and planning work stream, could you please tell us a bit more about the air pollution science and the opportunities you see for regional cooperation in well, the different regions in, in the world? Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Martina. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to consider the situation from the work that we've done with the CCAC and others in working with colleagues like Mr. Apo in Africa, Asia and Latin America, um, where in many countries air pollution is, is a serious problem. Um, so, I will address the, the first question about challenges, but first to say that there are also many opportunities if we can link the air pollution, climate change and development, you know, this is something that can point in the same direction. And there is a CCAC UNEP Africa assessment ongoing at the moment, which is trying to sort of like find out those linkages. But in terms of the challenges then, so despite the fact that air pollution you know, is increasingly being discussed. It is something that the population cares about in most parts of the world. 
it still does not have sufficient political backing or resources to put into solving the problems that are there. This means that, especially in some of the countries in Africa, Latin America and Asia, the capacity in government to address these issues is lacking. Um, lacking the capacity to undertake the planning, to identify the priority measures and then the resources to implement these. So there's also a need to track the progress on um, uh, track progress in implementing it. And, and if you have a lack of resources and trained people, it makes it rather difficult. Um, also, in many countries, the, the capacity to address climate change is often given priority, um, partly because countries have signed up to support a global treaty on this. Um, and so, of course, this is justified because it's a huge problem. But sometimes air pollution is a bit of a poor cousin. And the funding goes to um, international funding is made available to address climate change. And that's something we can learn from for air pollution. Um, for air pollution in most parts of the world, there's no need to report to a global or regional mechanism. And so um, there's limited funding to, for governments to, to support development of air capacity. Um, so um, I think that you know, one of the key issues is, is that the international funding can help support national capacity and also regional um, capacity to develop the approaches. Now, in terms of the regional um, or the, the air pollution and climate change topics, I mean, there are many reasons why air pollution and climate change need to be addressed together. There are so many opportunities um, and the concentration on climate change, as I said, can help solve air pollution, but only if there is an integrated planning linking these issues. So that's because most of the sources of CO2 co-emit significant amounts of air pollutants. Um, so fossil fuel use in transport, electricity generation, agriculture, etc. You know that you get both greenhouse gas emissions and you get air pollution emissions. So when you make a change to one of these sources, you have the potential to impact all of the co-emitted pollutants, but not always for the better. And I think Marcelo already gave um, the example of, of diesel um, that was promoted in, in Europe to reduce CO2 emissions, but it led to a terrible increase in air pollution. So. Um, and also, you know, there is a concentration now on end of pipe solutions to solve air pollution, but it doesn't do anything for reducing CO2. And sometimes it makes it higher, like putting flue gas desulfurization on a coal fired power station. So what you really need to do is be able to plan your air pollution, climate change mitigation together to look for ways of saving money, identifying measures that can address both of these issues and promote them rather than measures that solve one issue and makes the other worse. Um, secondly, we've got these some, some emissions causing both warming and are part of the air pollution problem. So black carbon has been mentioned. Um, it's an obvious one. It absorbs sunlight and, and affects global and regional weather patterns. And it's also part of the PM 2.5 affecting health. And then, of course, the methane is an important greenhouse gas, but it's, it's also an important precursor of ozone formation, which affects health and crops and forest yields. Um, so how do we develop this integrated planning? Well, SEI with the CCAC has been using the LEAP tool, such as in, in Ghana, to help countries develop integrated models for their GHG and air pollution scenario generation. And this empowers countries to identify win-win solutions for climate and air quality. But it does require further coordination within governments, partly between those responsible for air pollution and climate change, but also with the ministries that are going to be responsible for taking action but it can save money and make it more efficient. Now, finally, in terms of the regional um, uh, agenda, then there's a lot of reasons why regional cooperation can provide an important component to address air pollution in many parts of the world, but it doesn't really exist to put in the same way as, as, as in the LERTAP convention in Europe. So we've been working um, supporting national governments to develop the integration planning, as I said, but we've also been working to promote regional cooperation in different regions. So one thing we've been involved with in, in, in South Asia is the Mali Declaration since 1998. So all the countries agreed to cooperate. But the problem there was lack of resources put into this regional um, forum. Um, but one of the things we're trying to do at the moment is to revive it. And all the ministries of environment have all said that they want to cooperate. And so um, we need to then make sure that this is properly resourced, because I think that the resource, without the resources, 
put into this, um, you know, the, it, it needs to sort of kickstart both resources from within the region, but also from outside. And there are countries in South Asia who receive most of their air pollution from other countries. And so this transboundary air pollution means that it's really important. Um, and so I think that's uh, most of the things that I wanted to say. Um, but I think that there's a, a big opportunity in West Africa, as well as Mr. Apo was talking about, we've worked with a lot of countries in West Africa and the, there's a lot of things that could be done. There's a lot of solutions that could be um, developed at a, a regional scale. Um, and it can also galvanize activity at the national scale as well. So I think that putting all these things together is a really good idea. Thank you, Martina. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I think that has been, uh, well, nicely bringing together a lot of the, the, the topics. Um, we got a few questions and we, I don't think we'll have to time to go through all of them. There was one um, to, to Claudia actually about some of the um, other sectors, particularly the emphasis on fuel wood for cooking and so on. Um, if you'd like to come in on that or any other point, quick response, please. Uh, fantastic floor is yours. Yes, I try to be very quick. So thanks for the question. So of course I could name a, a lot of examples. Uh, yes, we do have a lot of projects also on clean access to clean energy uh, also in west africa uh, there is maybe you have heard some of you have heard ndef energizing development it's a big uh, initiative of multiple donors germany has to be there from the part and since 2005 23 million people have gained access to clean energy a clean cooking stove solar mini grids etc all over the world but i mean 23 million sounds a lot, but there are 3 billion people without access to clean energy. So the big job is much bigger. And then on the, on the transport part in West Africa or in Nigeria, we also have projects in Nigeria, not NDEF, uh, but like the TUMI transport urban mobility initiative or other projects on, on solar energy. So, and also to just cite another example, because there was another question on the South South cooperation. So we do a lot there too. We have, for example, a triangular cooperation between Mexico, India, and Germany uh, on air pollution. Uh, and there's a call community of practice. It's called visible cities. And we also have just uh, decided to fund a new project to support a regional approach to air quality and climate change in the ASEAN region. So that that's really, they will develop a roadmap for a regional approach to better air quality based on coordinated national air quality and climate action plans. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Both of activities that are going on. You already mentioned this uh, second question that has been put forward. Um, opportunities for South South cooperation uh, to address air pollution and climate. We heard a little bit about that already from different speakers, but I don't know whether someone feels compelled to come in a little further on on this one. Um, you're most welcome to do so. I just add one thing to what I was saying before. Um, when we were working with the Mali Declaration in the early 2000s, it was just looking at air pollution and, and it was not possible to make the link to climate change. Now it seems everybody wants to talk about them together. So, you know, the situation has changed. People are increasingly realizing the linkages. Um, and so there's some great opportunities there to, to um, put these things together, both at national and regional scales. So um, I think things could move quickly if we were to sort of um, be able to, to generate the activity in different parts of the world. Fantastic. Thank you, Johan. Anybody else? Andrew. Hey, Martina, yeah. just to quickly add to, to what I discussed earlier, I think that that it you know, one of the key ways that that South South cooperation can be very helpful is for for regional groups of countries in the same region to uh, work together to to collect data and work together to understand how emissions in one place are are affecting other other places. Like really, that that isn't something that that one country can do on its own. And and really, the countries in the region have to work together on that to really understand the the total picture of what's happening. So that is certainly very crucial and and something that is is important to happen. Um, and, and it's something that can really make a big difference and help countries really get kind of a head start on developing their capacity to address air quality. Thanks. Okay. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I see two more hands up. Um, I had meant to ask um, everybody for a closing statement um, with naming one thing you take away from today's event and one thing you would like the international community to start doing tomorrow. Um, and I ask uh, both of you, Emmanuel and uh, Marcelo, to maybe, if you can, weave that into, into your points already. <laughs> Thank you. So, Emmanuel, please. Yes, um, it's, it's very, very important. And such meeting is also, a, a, how to call it, a platform for, for, for engagement. And I think um, the, the South-South cooperation will be very, very important. We did this in 2002 when we were using lead in fuel, a lot of lead in the environment. And we came together in the regional body. We were able to face out lead, which was a good platform for that. And then, as I've said, and Clark also mentioned, we need to uh, know the, the sources of, of the pollution, collect data, and share for the, the, uh, the benefit of uh, uh, regional governments and regional institutions. So it's very, very important that we do that. And key aspect is that we have to get the legislation framework well. If it's not there, governments may say, oh, we don't have any legal backing, we don't have this, and not, no action will be taken. So policy formation and implementation. Together with awareness, you do the trick. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Marcelo. Yeah, thank you. So on the on the on the South South collaboration side, I think it's really important uh, that we we show the the, the we share experiences that are more uh, amenable. And I'll just tell you one thing that's very salient to me. For example, in methane mitigation, if we look at the California model, for example, um, you have a lot of uh, Expenditures that are available uh, for digesters, and uh, but in the in the capital uh, lo low capital availability in developing countries, uh, operational expenses are probably easier to to handle, and so therefore you know um, you have to look at that, and 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 so then you have to share what are the business models that are used uh, that are not subsidy heavy because the rest of the world doesn't have a big tax base that is able to spend a lot of money. And so therefore you have to make the business model work. And in that case, uh, the Canada Chile Corporation with the Recicla Organicos project was, which was uh, incubated in the context of the CCAC is a good example. We, uh, the, the legacy is dozens of uh, methane mitigating projects on composting and, and, and waste management. And therefore, now the government is considering a waste diversion of organic waste, uh, and and and, uh, and understanding that there is an incentive to expend extend the length of landfills by uh, diverting the organic waste and managing it through composting and other solutions. And so, we recently, as the methane hub, approved a grant to also do that design uh, in in Uruguay, Argentina, Colombia, and Mexico. Uh, so those projects could actually be done. And that's really important because uh, money for waste management exists, right? What you might not have money is how to design a composting facility or an anaerobic digester. That, so then therefore, if you wanna shift that funding, then uh, the, catalyt the catalytic investments of a uh, philanthropy can actually make something happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So the implementation funding is not available. The, the big financing is available. Final take home message and thanks for the invitation. Um, I think um, it's important that we do, do link these agendas officially. The CCAC has done so, but the efforts need to be sustained and the support from other agencies has to be important. The UNFCCC community, the climate negotiators do not really us think of this as a, something that we should be uh, supporting, and, and it is a error because um, you know we overlook opportunities. I remember when Margaret Chan and COP21 would come in uh, with uh, with a little p uh, page saying, "Put climate, put health in the climate agreement." And when I went to the negotiator, they're like, "Why? What should we put health in there?" I mean, you know, this is, but and you know, you you might be forgetting the reason that the reason why we're doing this is human health. And so, therefore, we had to put health back at the agenda and, and never lose sight of it. If we're being counting climate co benefits without looking at the opportunities that we get from developing countries that actually see the political economy, the local actions that they take, because they gain a benefit, you know, because they don't have to wait for China or the US to take action because they gain a benefit right away. If they don't have that opportunity, then we miss out on action that we could have taken much earlier. Thanks so much.
Thank you, uh, Marcelo. Very vibrant call, not only a call for action and making the case of the connections, but also showing some of those actions, how they're being being rolled out. So thank you. Um, we've come to the end, but um, I promised um, well, um, also Andrew, Johan and uh, Claudia, one thing that you uh, would like the international community to start doing tomorrow. Andrew? <laughs> You were the first to put up your hand. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, I think that um, to just to be very quickly, I think that my my big takeaway is is was really hearing the the really powerful um, statements from from Rosamond in the beginning. And I think that that I think it would be great for um, as a as a first important step for the the global community to really start emphasizing that air pollution isn't just something that's inconvenient it isn't just something that is uncomfortable or makes the air look unpleasant it is something that is very dangerous and something that is harming people all around the world and i think that's going to that's really the first step to to really driving um you know grassroots um you know action and and to really bring political will to this devastating problem thank you fantastic thank you claudia yeah, I really want that we express the sense of urgency. Yeah, and and then of course not just expressing that sense of urgency, but then including clean air as a topic in the different sectors. So that means policies, projects that relate to clean energy, health, mobility, transport, city planning, and agriculture. Fantastic. Thank you, Johan. So oh, my take-home message would be, you know, support, fund, and enhance capacity in governments and other institutions and countries so they can better address air pollution and enhance their integrated planning and implementation of measures. Um, if I'm allowed another couple, uh, allocate international funds so that regional approach can be successful. And finally, develop integrated planning between climate change and air pollution, but also to provide and quantify other development benefits to make sure that all ministries are pointing in the same direction. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a fantastic panel. Um, also, thanks to our chief scientist of, of UNEP, Andrea Hinwood, and our keynote, Rosamund Kissy Debra. Um, all the messages were very clear. I think uh, objective accomplished in terms of putting um, the issue of air pollution and the connection between air pollution and climate very much on the radar. Um, and to highlight how global and regional cooperation is necessary to address the transboundary air pollution crises and the detrimental effects on sustainable development. I think we, we heard it loud and clear, the sense of urgency, uh, but also a message that uh, there are no borders. That means we need to have, we, we need to act together. We need all hands on deck from the individuals to the mayors, from the local, the regional to the global levels. And uh, a very clear uh, message as well that there are solutions. We need to invest more in measurements and, and data, but that's not a reason to hold us back from taking action. Uh, we know enough to take the action, but uh, uh, it's important to, to, to have a bit more of, of that data uh, while we already start acting on this. And um, I think what, uh, what Rosamund said at the beginning, one child per minute dying somewhere, um, I think that says it all. So. No time to lose, not a single minute. So thank you very much uh, for all of your time, for your valuable contributions. And uh, a thank you as well to our co-organizers, so the governments of Germany, Ghana, the UN Environment Programme, and the Climate and Climate Coalition. Thank you, and bye-bye.